All right, thank you very much. We're going to get the second panel rolling. I'm very impressed. So in thinking about the topics for the day, obviously the REV process was on everybody's mind. It's absolutely a pioneering effort to deal with a lot of the issues of the electric utility sector across the, across the nation and to do it in one of the, the most uh, uh, remarkable markets in the country. But we were also very conscious of the national movement and the New York movement to a clean energy economy and the ambitious goals that have been established by Governor Cuomo and are, are um, very high in the minds of people who actually pay attention to the science. Um, we need to move to a clean energy economy. So our second panel is going to be focusing on the relationship of the transmission system to that ambition and what has to happen to achieve it. And to, to, and to moderate that second panel, I'm thrilled that we have Peter Baer. Peter is a longtime um, lead writer with e and &E News and the Energy Environment News. And it, you know, and to my opinion, if you only read the publications that E&E &E puts out, you would be fully up to date with everything you need to know. <laughs> but needless to say, there are a lot of other publications that, that almost all of us read. But that's, that's and he's, uh, um, uh, going to be excellent as a moderator. So, Peter, let me turn it over to you. Thank you very much. So, we're going to try to proceed with a uh, kind of a split vision uh, perspective where we look uh, at in greater detail at uh, the really innovative things that, that New York and the Northeast region uh, are doing, uh, and but also do that in the context of a national uh, climate and clean energy imperative that uh, is represented by the, the, the uh, EPA's uh, clean power plan and, and its requirements. And uh, uh, we're very fortunate to be able to lead off with uh, Gil Quinones, who's going to uh, uh, start the panel. And then uh, we'll move right down the table to each of the other uh, members uh, of the panel up here who have uh, their, their own perspectives on how they're engaging with New York uh, and with this national uh, a clean energy challenge. And I just wanted to uh, open with a quick anecdote maybe to set uh, the stage here. And uh, it involves a, uh, uh, a $300 million transmission line that uh, ITC Great Plains opened across uh, Kansas uh, uh, this last year, um, 345 kV. Um, in an interview, uh, Christine Schmidt, the ITC president at Great Plains, said, you know, they had they considered uh, and, and had proposed a 765 kV line, which would have tripled the capacity and would have given uh, a lot of headroom to accommodate, uh, in particular, the clean power plan and some of the, the uh, additional power that's going to have to be provided to replace that from the coal plants that are going to uh, retire. Uh, and they couldn't get it. Uh, there just was no interest in uh, discussing uh, an anticipatory uh, addition of capacity on the transmission grid that would have created the kind of flexibility uh, that would have been very helpful to uh, meeting the, the CPP challenges. And she said um, she didn't have any fault with the way that the, uh, the uh, state authorities uh, in her region uh, handled transmission proposals. She says, it's just that we as a nation continued to build what we need today versus planning for a long-term modern transmission infrastructure. And the question is, uh, is it possible to do better? So uh, with that as kind of a maybe a framing question, uh, let me ask uh, our keynote speaker on this panel to uh, lead off. Good morning. Thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you to Columbia. Thank you to long friend John and your team and putting this great event together. Um, luckily, NIPA owns the only 765 kV line in New York. <laughs> so we actually own a line that connects us to Hydro-Quebec all the way to down to Utica. Uh, you're right. I don't know whether we can build another 765 line today. That is a, a great question. Um, Steve Mitnick and John Wellinghoff are both very good friends of mine, so I'm not going to get into the Edison-Tesla 
fight and argument, but uh, I just want to make one note that both made it their inventions here in New York. Edison down at Pearl Street in Lower Manhattan, and Tesla, Westinghouse, the first transmission of electricity from Niagara Falls to Buffalo. That is why this conference is in New York, because this is where we're going to, again, change the electric industry. Um, just a little bit of information about NIPA. NIPA is the largest state-owned public electric utility. We generate about one-fourth of all electrons in New York State, and we own a third <coughs> of the high-voltage grid. So transmission is near and dear to our hearts. We serve um, governmental customers. For example, uh, I have one of my biggest customers here, OSCA, the city of New York, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey, New York City Housing Authority, all the large state buildings in New York City and Westchester County are customers of NIPA. Uh, we also, one of our primary purpose is economic development, so we provide lower cost power to businesses across the state to attract jobs and spur investment. So that's our set of, of we have customers, business customers across the state and we serve, this is probably not a, a very well-known fact, uh, 47 very small municipal distribution utilities called munis, like the town of Salve, the city of Jamestown, are municipal utilities, and four rural cooperative utilities across the state. So those are our customers. Now about transmission. This is the grid of New York. The uh, brown ones are NIPA's transmission, and they interconnect our 18 power plants, or 16 power plants that we own, and two that we lease under a long-term contract. If you really look at NIPA's system, we are the backbone of the New York State grid. Mark Lynch is here president and CEO of NYSIG and RGE. &E. We have a partnership with Mark and his team in building smart grid technology on our existing 345 KV line that starts from the Utica area all the way to the lower Hudson Valley. By applying smart grid technology, serious compensation technology, we're increasing transfer capability of 440 megawatts at a fraction of a cost of generation. So those are the kind of things that former Chair Wellinghoff was talking about before. We are replacing the line that connects us to Vermont. Velco is the name of their grid operator. It's our PV20 replacement. This is a line underground underneath Champlain River. It's a $70 million investment. It will increase our transfer capability with Vermont. Moses Adirondack, 70 plus year old line built by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, not even by NIPA, this happened before NIPA. We are in the process of licensing and replacing that 230 kV, 85 miles, and we believe that we're going to be able to do it with state of the art technology, increasing transfer capability with Hydro-Quebec by again another 200, 300 megawatts. Mark mentioned this, another partnership. We've, we've done such a great job with the smart grid at Marcy South. We said, let's do it again. In Western New York, under FERC 1000 and Newark ISO process, we are partnering with NYSEG rg &E to build a 25 mile 345 KV that will strengthen the grid in Western New York. And as Mark said, make sure that the 2700 megawatt of clean power from Niagara gets pumped freely onto the grid. That's the largest power plant in New York City, in New York City, in New York State, I'm sorry. And it's actually not one power plant. 13 units on the Moses da Dam and another 13 units on the pump storage portion. 26 power plants 
totally 2,700 megawatts of nameplate capacity. Con Edison, Sergei Manovsky mentioned that they are building Ramapoto Rock Tavern, that's a 345 kV line. They're also thinking about unbottling an existing line from New Jersey to Staten Island. So the combination of all those projects will help strengthen the grid downstate, just in case future plant retirements occur and make sure that the in-city capacity and reliability in New York City is maintained. The AC proceeding, and I really want to commend Chairman, uh, uh, Chairwoman Zibelman, Audrey. The courage to go through this process is not that easy because of the siting issues. There are a lot of, transmission is a lot hard. Power plant, you're dealing with one community usually to get your permit. Transmission, you're dealing with multiple communities, hamlets, village, and towns. And, and saying that we need to build a thousand, at least a thousand megawatts of transfer capability from Albany all the way down to lower Hudson Valley with all the political and local concern. That took a lot of courage from Audrey and her team under the le leadership of Governor Cuomo Energy Highway Initiative. There is one line uh, that got licensed, TDI, Transmission Development Inc. Uh, from Quebec all the way down to New York City. Uh, let's see whether that's gonna get built, but at least they've gotten their license both at the federal and state level. So sometimes when we talk about New York, about transmission, people think nothing is happening. There's a lot happening. I'm not even counting the projects of the utilities. I'm sure Mark can tell you for Nisigan RG&E at the 115 kV level. And Rudy at National Grid at the 115 kV level. There's a lot of reinforcement going on that eventually will make the network more effective and efficient. But I wanted to show you before we, we go through this esteemed panel that there's a lot going on in the area of transmission. So what are the other trends that I think will happen? And, and a, lo a lot of this or some of this were touched on by the previous panelists. Power electronics, so now I'm, you know, I was wearing my NIPA hat. I'm, I'm also the chairman of the board of the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI. And uh, these are the kind of things that we're seeing, not just in the US, but all over the world. EPRI is an international organization, so we get a chance to learn and to see what other people are doing around the world. Power electronics will, al will allow bi-directional energy flow on our transmission grid. That's gonna be an important change in the future. There's a lot of cutting edge sensor technology that will enable the grid to run close to, but not over the edge. So we can extract more system efficiency from our systems. Data analytics, in, in addition to power electronics and sensors, will allow us to predict the future. When I say the future, it could be five milliseconds to five minutes to one hour to one year to five years to 10 years and help us in our, not just operation, but planning. And clean power plans, state goals, transmission is needed to bring renewables from remote areas to load centers. So I think those are the things that we're going to be seeing in transmission. NIPA, for example, we, we probably are the only utility that owns a convertible static converter in Utica. What is that? It's basically a fast switch. We're able to switch 200 or 300 megawatts from one transmission corridor to another instantaneously, managing the congestion in central New York where Sergey pointed there, there's congestion. We are building in our uh, St. Lawrence FDR power project, which is on the northern tip of New York, a town called Messina, just right on the St. Lawrence River. The most advanced transmission substation in the world. It will have the most sophisticated 
relay and protection control system because a lot of the wind farms are interconnected to our system up there. So we need to have the visibility and the operational capability to integrate the renewables. And it is based on the IEC standard 61850. It will be the largest and the most sophisticated transmission substation, at least in the US. We are employing dynamic line rating technology at NIPA, which means, you know, right now, if you're an electrical engineer, you, you calculate the ratings of all the lines that are in existence, and the operators run it at those specified parameters. We are putting instrumentation so that we actually know how much power at every instant our transmission lines are carrying, and therefore we can back it up or back it down depending on those readings. So we are digitizing NIPA's generation and transmission system. New York Utilities installed a lot of PMUs five, six years ago, and now we're starting to make use of that and also some capacitor banks. So a lot is going in New York, and specifically at NIPA. And we believe that is our role as the largest public power utility in the nation. Our role is to lead by example. Our role is to inspire shared visions so that if we can prove that these are things that benefit New Yorkers, that all the utilities will follow and do the same things that we have been doing. I just want to point a couple of very important things before I, I end. FERC 1000 is very important. Right now, the competition in Western New York is under that process, and then the AC proceeding will be under that process. So we're going to have a couple of examples and exercises, and we need to, to tweak that. It's, to me, it's a little slow, as Chairman Wellinghoff said. We've got to get it faster. Uh, the other thing is the NISO planning process is only 10 years. I think it ought to be at least 20 years planning horizon, and it ought to count consumer benefits, not just production costs, and maybe even externalities because we, we need to support our climate change goals. And when we do that, when we count all these other benefits and extend it to 20 years, I think we're going to build more transmission under FERC 1000. Uh, and of course, siting. And I want to commend Governor Cuomo. Governor Cuomo passed, it's probably not familiar to, to many of you, what we're calling the transmission easy pass siting law. <laughs> if you use existing rights of ways, you stay within the 3D envelope of the existing, existing right of ways or underground transmission, you will get approval within 10 months of a complete Article 7 siting application. And I think that's going to force transmission developers to be innovative, to use the latest technology. Because if you can do that, if you can stay within the 3D envelope or go underground, you will have 10 months from Audrey Zivelman and her team. She probably will kill me right now if I tell, <laughs> if I, you know, I've been telling this right now. But that's the law, that's the regulation. And so I think that's very exciting. With that, uh, thank you very much for having me, and, and, and later on, I'll be happy to answer your questions. We're gonna go down the panel now, five to seven minutes if we could, and uh, the next person we're gonna hear from, and we're very pleased to have, is uh, Steve Demers from uh, Hydro-Quebec. And um, just uh, within the past week, uh, a really interesting uh, RFP was uh, uh, was received, uh, applications were received by uh, three New England states that involve uh, wind power from New York backed up by uh, hydropower from C Quebec, which has uh, North America's largest hy hydro resource. And it kind of illustrates the potential for uh, wind and hydro to work together to uh, move forward and, and get much closer to uh, renewable goals. So uh, turn it over to you to talk Thank a little you, bit about your, uh, the increasing connections between uh, your hydro resources and the U.S. Uh, clean energy goals. That's a great lead-in. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. We're really happy to be here uh, today. Uh, what a great presentation, Gil. Thank you. Um, it, it reminds me of a sort of a data point that we don't 
talk about too often, but I'm, I'm, I'm doing it out of, the, out of the gate this morning. Uh, we talked about St. Lawrence River and generating stations and transmission with Hydro-Quebec. Quebec and New York have been exchanging electricity since 1914. So this is something that we're always building on and uh, some, an historical fact that I find, uh, that I always find uh, interesting. Wanted to start out very quickly this morning with a couple of photos of, of generating station. This is La Romaine 2. This is one of our latest generating stations in the east uh, portion of Quebec, north of the, of the St. Lawrence. Commissioned in late 14, just before that winter period where we have very strong demand. This is a 640 megawatt generating station. This fall, downstream, La Romaine 1, no surprise, 1, 2, was commissioned, 270 megawatts, as part of that complex, which is being built out until 2020. In, a few, in a, just a couple of years, 900 megawatts of clean, renewable energy that is now being developed. And that's the story that we're seeing more and more in Canada and in other areas where hydropower can be developed. And it's really exciting to see that it's being done in other regions. Wanted to leave you with a quick facts on Hydro-Quebec, sort of the supply demand equation. Access to a little over uh, more than a little over 200 ter terawatt hours of supply. So the Quebec, uh, Hydro-Quebec has access to a little over 200. The local load, the demand, yearly demand, is call it around 170. And that leaves available energy of approximately 30 terawatt hours that are currently being, that are made available. Most of that 30 terawatt hours is sold in the wholesale markets to the mechanisms that you know very well, New England and New York. So remember those facts, important. You're not surprised to see the, the, uh, the blue pie. The discussion today is about clean energy. It's about transmission. It's about making sure that it is reliable and economic ultimately to the consumer. In essence, what we're talking about is an evolution, an optimizing, optimization of the supply mix. And that's very much how we look at it from a, a macro regional point of view. And we think we're well positioned to look at it from that point of view. So you have a picture here, sort of a pie of the supply mix for electricity generation in different areas. When we, look, when we look at this in the Northeast, we think we can contribute. We talked about bulk and distribution. There are clearly distinctions between both. At the bulk level, we really think we're, we can be part of the solution, and I underline part. So that's what we'll talk about today. Thank you. Ed Kraples, our, Ed Kraples, our next speaker is a, a transmission uh, pioneer uh, who um, is one of the uh, developers competing for the RFP in uh, New England, uh, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut uh, to uh, partner wind and, uh, and hydropower to, uh, to meet uh, New England's uh, clean power uh, goals. And uh, so perhaps you can talk about that, that project and, and, uh, and how order 1,000 uh, may be helping and, and maybe where it needs to be improved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. And there's so many people to thank here. First, let me thank the organizers of this great event for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Happy to be a, a sponsor. I um, also want to thank Chairman Wellinghoff for Order 1000, without which my business would probably not exist. Um, uh, I want to thank Gil and other uh, policymakers in the state of New York because you've given my company opportunities that we have been able to take advantage of in ways that I'd like to explore with you right now. Mark Lynch talked about smart developers in the distribution space. 
I'm not sure I'm a smart developer, but um, I am the kind of developer that initiates projects. We like to get them started and then uh, with, uh, with help from people who finish the projects, uh, we have been able to accomplish a couple and we have three more in the immediate pipeline right now, one in New York and two in New England. And we try to design these to optimize the current system. So you, you'll note that there are some projects that are uh, designed as if the rest of the system didn't exist, and there are some projects that are designed to optimize the system as it does exist. And as we go through that exercise over the years, we learned about five years ago this new phrase in, uh, that in this started in the great state of Vermont called NTA. You guys know what NTA means? It's a non-transmission alternatives. And we were so taken by that idea that we actually developed a part of our company that develops uh, NTAs, uh, or also known as microgrids. And so we today are responding to RFPs both from the transmission business and from the NTA business. And to give you an example of what that looks like to us, um, the RFP from New England gave rise to the Vermont Greenlight Project, which I'll mention to you in a second. Uh, we think there will be further RFPs in New England for much, much, much more renewable energy. Uh, the state of Massachusetts is talking about thousands of megawatts of clean energy to meet its RPS standards. And now, of course, we have the state of New York with 50 by 30, um, and the implications of what 50 by 30 means for the bulk uh, power system. On the microgrid side, we now have RFPs. We had the New York Prize, which gave rise to dozens of interesting projects and proposals. We have, in Long Island, the South Fork RFP that my company responded to. And we now also have the Rockaways RFP, which when it came out was for 275 megawatts. And I thought, well, that's a big microgrid, isn't it? And so it probably represents the first, from our perspective, the first joint transmission and microgrid proposal that we'll ever have made. And I think this is the kind of change and hopefully the kind of innovation that we need to meet these very, very ambitious goals. So very quickly, here's a project that might set the stage for what New York should <coughs> consider doing. New England may, if this RFP response is successful, import 400 megawatts of clean energy from a combination of wind in New York and hydro from Hydro-Quebec. Now that combination is, is so sensible because as you all know, transmission is expensive. This is an underground HVDC line and in order to make the maximum use of that line, the wind only blows a third of the time. And so to make the project deliver as much clean energy as possible, I'm so grateful to Hydro-Quebec and Steve, the mayor specifically, for being willing to be, if you will, the firming energy source for the wind that will be generated by Invenergy at the Bull Run 400 megawatt wind farm. What a great project, what a great combination. All credit to National Grid for being the sponsor and the developer of this project. And I think this is the sort of thing that New York should consider looking at as well. So very quickly, if I'm the guy chosen by the organizers to remind you that New York is a self-confident trading state that doesn't have to do all of its renewables in state, what does a trading solution to the clean energy challenge look like? Well, if I can get this to work, I want you to recognize that there are three load areas in the greater Northeast that all must be served with clean energy. So you have New York, Connecticut, Boston, you have Toronto, and you have Montreal. Montreal is very well served already by Hydro-Quebec. Toronto has major issues. It needs a lot of new clean energy. And of course, in New York, both New York and New England are now saying our future is clean and green. So how do we meet this demand? Well, let's start with what Steve just put on the board, Hydro-Quebec and its fabulous hydro resource. Let's add to that the hydro resources that Nalcor is trying to develop in uh, Labrador and Newfoundland. Let's add to that 
hydro resources in PJM. And Gil, I'm not going to add the New York hydro resources largely because I think they're mostly spoken for, and I don't see hundreds of megawatts of new hydro being developed in New York. Where's the wind? The wind is in upstate New York. There's wind in Quebec. There's wind in western New York. There's huge amount of wind in Pennsylvania, I'm PJM, and there's huge amounts of wind in upstate Maine. So what does that mean? What does transmission look like if we're going to bring this stuff into New York? Well, oh, and we have huge offshore wind as well. Well, we have transmission from Quebec. It could pick up, as it does already in the Vermont Green Line, wind from upstate New York and bring a bundled clean energy product into New York. I don't think it needs to go to New York City. I think it can stop in Albany or it can stop in Buchanan and use the existing network, optimization of the existing network, instead of going all the way into Manhattan. Hydro-Quebec obviously is going to be looking at Toronto. There may be more uh, business for you guys there. Western New York might also look to Toronto for business opportunities. To bring wind from Western New York into Central and Southern New York is a big lift, and I'm not sure after the amount of difficulty it was to get 1,000 megawatts approved from, from upstate to downstate, I'm not sure how much AC transmission New York can do from the west to the east. But there's business to the west as well. PJM represents for New York a fantastic affordable resource. Wind resources there are five cents. We can bring that wind into Long Island and Manhattan through our HUDC lines. Um, Quebec will have the opportunity to team up with Maine Wind, uh, and New Brunswick and the Maritimes will have an opportunity to bring Nalcor Wind into the region as well. So what are the scales? What are we looking at? Very quickly, the Vermont Green Line is like a, a nice little starter project at 400 megawatts. I think Hydro-Quebec and New York Wind could team up for 2,000 megawatts. Uh, which happens coincidentally to be the size of the Indian Point nuclear station. There could be a thousand megawatt export from the west, uh, from the western New York into Toronto. I think there's 2,000 megawatts of wind and hydro we can bring in from PJM. Delivered, I think that will be 80 to 90 dollars a megawatt hour. We have 2,000 megawatts that will go from Maine into southern New England, and we have 2,000 megawatts from the offshore into the urban areas. To me, this is the future. This is the project set that we're going to have to be uh, trying to develop over the next 10 years. Thank you. Abby Dillon, who's going to speak next, is one of the top environmental litigators uh, in the energy scene, and the environment scene, and, uh, and she's fought uh, power line projects we know successfully and she's also uh, been in court to defend the clean power plant. So uh, can you tell us are there good transmission lines and bad transmission lines <laughs> from the standpoint of uh, clean energy? <laughs> let me think about that. <laughs> <laughs> well let me, let me say thank you to Bill and John for inviting me here. It is such a privilege to be in this room and to be able to learn from all of you. You know, this is very quiet and civilized in here, but something radical is, is happening in New York. Let me tell you a little bit about what Earth Justice does so that you can appreciate the perspective I bring, which I think is different than others on the panel. Um, we're a nonprofit public interest law firm, which means we represent um, primarily NGOs for free in the public interest to protect the environment. My focus is on climate and energy. In this space, we represent clients and venues from the PUCs, in, including in New York, um, to the FERC, to the Supreme Court in defending Order 1000 and Order 745. And thank you to the Supreme Court indeed on those. Um, and my work takes me all over the country. and. Um, sometimes I don't spend enough time in New York, so when I was preparing remarks today, I was assuming that I would need to make the case that then Chair Zibelman made point by point. And so 
um, you, you find yourself here in radical agreement among all the stakeholders about the need and urgency for reform of the way that we make and use and distribute energy, um, the, the incredible uh, time-sensitive deadline we are on for doing that, um, and, and the different ways that we're going to have to um, link up what has been sort of two separate worlds on the distribution side and, and on the generation and transmission side. So all of those basic points, which would just sound crazy in many of the states where I work, are the foundation for our discussion today. So what I would like to focus on is the sort of lawyerly enterprise of enforcing our radical agreement. And by that I mean there are powerful historical forces in play here. We know how to do some things the way we've always done them. And there are very strong economic, economic incentives to build transmission and to build utility scale renewables. And we know that's part of the equation, but it isn't the whole equation. And so how are we going to work fast enough to, to institute the reforms, create the market incentives, um, so that transmission is one part of the solution, but it, that it's competing with and complementing a, a whole array of other solutions that we need to promote to the fore. Um, so getting back to the idea of Order 1000 and its promise, um, what I would like us to be thinking about in a practical way is how do we really do this planning, understanding the need for dynamism, right? How do we set our goals, environmental goals 50 by 30? I would also submit equity goals. We have a chance to remedy longstanding inequities in access to energy in this state and around the country. So how do we work backwards from the right environmental, economic, and equity goals um, to ensure that we're not overbuilding transmission? That undercuts all the cost benefits we can reap from clean energy. Um, it's not light on the land, which is going to incent the opposition, that, that pesky opposition <laughs> that's been referred to earlier. Um, and, and so um, how do we make those metrics really enforceable? How do we ensure that we are approving projects on their ability to meet carbon metrics and meet um, economic and equity metrics? Two, how do we really ensure that we're looking at the non-wires alternatives or the NTAs? It's so crucial that we do that and that we do it at the distribution edge. That's a, a really new way of doing business. New York and California, Hawaii have this unique opportunity as states that are coterminous with their ISOs. And so this is a laboratory to try out new solutions that might be replicable on a much larger footprint. But you know, making, making 13 states in PJM agree to link up their distribution solutions and make wires solutions compete there is going to take a lot, of, a lot of thinking, and I'm so glad that we're getting ahead of the game here in New York. Um, and finally, on this, on this question about the pesky opposition, my view is that the people who are opposing transmission lines and gas lines, many of them come to this problem because suddenly there is a giant new piece of infrastructure proposed in their backyards. But I've represented these groups and I can tell you they become sophisticated so quickly about how the energy world works. And they also, many of them may not start as climate activists, but they become climate activists through the course of recognizing how our energy system works. They are a resource. They are not just something to be contended with. And as we try to look for new solutions, we have to be looking for ideas everywhere. It really puts a premium, I, I, think, I think Chair Zivelman was making this point. To the extent that we were actually examining the alternatives in a transparent way and coming to justified conclusions about what transmission lines are truly needed and what transmission lines are not going to impose undue burdens on ratepayers, the not-in-my-backyard opposition becomes much less powerful. 
So I would suggest that the people who are paying attention to where we're siting transmission lines and gas pipelines for that matter can be allies and stakeholders in this process. And the more that we embrace that role, the better decisions that we will come out with and the less litigation there will be for me to do, which I will be happy to cede that ground. <laughs> Thank you, and please welcome a, a new addition to the panel, uh, Michael Eckhart, who is the uh, global head of, of uh, environmental finance for Citigroup, and a, a great person to talk to us about uh, what the realities of, of, of financing uh, are going to be uh, for this transition. Thank you, Reed. and thanks to David and, and John and Peter for allowing me to move up in the schedule. I just have to be someplace else at 3 o'clock, and I couldn't move that. Well, uh, first of all, I work at Citigroup. Uh, you know it as Citibank, but there's a whole hidden half of it, uh, clearly half of the organization that's the business-to-business -business side of Citi. And I'm in corporate and investment banking, which is one unit of that, uh, along with capital markets and transaction services and things like that that we do for our 32,000 corporate clients. And a very interesting number I'll just share with you. I still can't get over it, uh, this, this number that in the little transaction services division, very hidden in the background, uh, that doesn't lend any money, doesn't do any capital market, just does transactions for clients as a business, it moves $3 trillion a day. <laughs> I can't get over that. And we're just one bank. And we know we have 11% market share, so I can tell you there's, there's uh, 27 uh, quadrillion dollars uh, moving a year in this world, which is a little larger than the 65 billion or for 65 trillion that most people think is the GDP of the world. The actual cash economy is mind boggling how big it is. So it's, it's great to be in such a big organization. And we did in renewable energy financing, uh, this is past year, we'll be announcing it probably in about two weeks, uh, right around 30 billion of financings ourselves. And the total worldwide count, according to new energy <coughs> finance, is 329 billion worldwide into clean energy investment of all kinds uh, last year. So we, we participated in just under 10% of all the deals done worldwide. That's a very large market share. And we do a lot of wind power in Texas and California uh, and everywhere in the country and Canada and everywhere. So I'll bring that perspective. And the one point, oh, I wanted to just, just say, uh, I haven't mentioned this in decades, but I actually took the MGT course at Purdue in 1972, being a double E from there. And that's not a type of an MG car. That's motors, generators, and tr transmission <laughs> uh, engineering. And I took it because I read that it would be the last time it was being offered. They were closing the course, and Purdue, a, a producer of thousands of double E's a year, no longer offers motors, generators, and transmission. I, and I think this is something that the Energy Future Coalition should address. <laughs> okay? All right, so I wanted to say that. Uh, secondly, I was a co-developer I was a developer for many years in the IPP business and successfully co-developed the Selkirk gas-fired uh, combined cycle plants here in, here in New York. So I personally dealt with the old Nipole and Nipole. And that's the point of perspective I want to bring. And that is, uh, to Ed's presentation, I'm just going to say the same thing, a little icing on your cake, Ed. All right? Well, I wanted to bring, if that's, no, it's not up there, the regional perspective. And what I see in New York, I love New York, I love the plant, I love REV, these are fantastic things. But a little too much New York is New York. And I remember that from my Selkirk experience that even the Nightpool people wouldn't even speak to the Nightpool people. And this was, uh, and, and, and uh, John tells me that that's been repaired a bit and it's, it's working better and New York and PJM are working well together. But it's the regional perspective that is really gonna do what we wanna do in clean energy, uh, not each state. I mean, each state has to do their own thing. But the regional connectivity is equally important to what goes on in the state in my view. From the financing perspective, you're addressing a risk that ruins a lot of potential wind farms and solar projects, not only here, but around the world, and that is the risk of curtailment. Just because a physical wire exists from the wind farm to a load center doesn't mean that wire can handle the load. And that was clearly the case in the early days of wind development in Texas, which resulted in a massive build out of transmission to eliminate that. When we do the spreadsheet on a project financing, we not only do the theoretical potential, we do the realistic potential. Is there curtailment risk here? Will those revenues actually show up uh, year after year for that project? 
And there are many where the answer is no. There are not the revenues the bank thought was going to be there, <coughs> and it's a lesson learned. And so curtailment risk is an actual analysis. It's like stress testing, if you will. We're stress testing that project proposal. And if clear, if it's not 100% clear that, that transmission capacity is there for that project, the, re the financials are going to get reduced, the equity requirement's going to go up, the developer's going to scream, the cost of debt's going to go up, the tenor of the debt's going to shorten up, everything starts to change, and suddenly a beautiful project, just because of curtailment risk, is not going to get financed. Right? It's just <coughs> going to be one of those that struggled and just didn't get done. So what I'm saying, to coin a phrase, is the project financing requires that transmission is a precursor to successful renewable energy development. The transmission has to be there before the project. Now you've got good examples where they're coincident and transmission's being built to support a big project. That's going on in Wyoming today mm -hmm. to get power to California from <coughs> 1,000 megawatts or, or 10,000 megawatts out in Utah and Wyoming. But project financing requires the transmission is a precursor to successful clean energy development. I just want to say that, we have to learn that. It's going on in China today. Uh, curtailments are up to 20% in China with their massive build-out. Now, it's a little, lots of misinformation about that. It happens that the transmission and, and project development are two different governmental budgets, one state grid and the other are d uh, power companies, two different things. They're not coordinated at all. And so you do have a mis mismatch there it's still going on. Um, but there is that mismatch of timing where transmission comes in three years after the wind farm is already built. But even when they connect curtailment issues uh, because the system prefers to run the, the coal-fired plants because they have to make money and they'll, they'll curtail the wind farms because there's not enough transmission to do both, even though the load centers need both. So these, these dynamics have to be factored in. And we're seeing the transmission constraint elsewhere around the world. Now, the great examples, of course, are Texas. And, um, and San Diego out, out in the Imperial Valley where a transmi transmission line was built in order to facilitate renewable energy development out there. And that's the kind of thing I'm talking about and encouraging that on a regional basis here to support, to support New York. And of course, Desert Tech trying to do the same thing in, in North Africa, linking Europe, Hawaii trying to put in, an, looking at an undersea cable to get geothermal power to the load centers. Again, transmission is a precursor to successful renewable energy development. And so uh, I could say some other things, but that's the message and from the financial community. It's a very real risk. We actually analyze the risk. We debate the risk. We put it in the spreadsheets and just know that that's occurring and transmission can be the key to success here. Thanks. Let's, let's go to your questions now. We've got about uh, 25 minutes. And uh, who, who wants to start out? So I'll start out. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, the panelists if, if they could think of, of one hurdle that stands in the way of this process we've been discussing where you have to create certainty for investment and you have to allow for flexibility uh, in what the outcome is going to be between uh, uh, big renewable projects with big transmission and kind of bottoms up uh, development of consumer and third party resources. So we don't know how that, that mix is going to occur, but we can't wait for it uh, because the, the system has got to change. So I'd, anybody on the panel like to say kind of what, what do you see as the, um, as maybe a guiding principle for managing this uncertainty uh, that we face with um, the need to create a, uh, an investment climate that works, and also to be flexible about solutions. Can I volunteer one? And uh, you see this in New England, and I, you'll see it here as well. When someone decides to issue a long-term contract or an RFP for a long-term contract mm -hmm. for renewable energy, the gas folks stand up and say, that's not the market. And a couple of months ago, I had an opportunity to ask those guys two questions. One is, when you did your uh, financed your house. Did you accept a mortgage whose interest rate changes every day? Or did you lock in a 20-year rate? And of course they say, I locked in a 20-year rate. So there needs to be room in people's thinking for long-term contracts at fixed prices. 
because uh, the gas folks cannot assure us that 10 years from now, the price of gas will still be two or three dollars a million BTU. So in that same panel, I asked a wind fellow and a gas fellow to give me a 20 year fixed price for electricity. And I said, who do you think would win if you had to give me a 20 year fixed price for electricity? And guess what? The wind guy won because the futures market for, elect for, for natural gas is only good for three or four years. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not illicit for society to have a number of long-term contractual commitments to clean energy if that's the best way to get it financed. I think that's, uh, we talked earlier about market forces and, and how competition will, will help. And I think that's, that's very true. And, and we, we can draw lessons from what, uh, from the results and the, uh, the bids and the project propositions that have been uh, presented to New England just, just recently. I think by creating an opportunity for, for folks to, uh, to get together and think about good solutions, uh, minimizing what we talked about just a few minutes ago, curtailment, you know, uh, and offering a really complete solution to, to a region. I think when you, when you allow uh, a competitive process, when you allow for other market mechanisms to, to, uh, to, take, uh, to take shape, you can, uh, you can end up with really good results. Another thing that Ed just talked about, which we've not talked about today, is price predict uh, predictability uh, and also price suppression uh, of certain renewable, um, clean and renewable resources. What we are seeing uh, from a macro point of view is an, a very, very beneficial impact on predictability and lower prices. And I think over the long term, and these are infrastructures that are put in place for many, many years, if not decades, those are really great benefits. And it's interesting because we're seeing those benefits come through the build out and the implementation of clean and renewable resources, a variety of them. That's a very positive outcome that we must talk more about. I'll, I'll address it too, is that okay? Just, just a small point from the financing point of view. Uh, if you have long, long lived assets and you're running a competition on a short term basis, you've eliminated long term financing. You're going to have short term financing because it's all tied to the, the assurance you have. Um, and you all understand this. It's why you get a 30 year mortgage on your home uh, because there's assurance that it'll, the asset will be there and be worth more later. Um, but it, it, I don't want to use that uh, analogy too much, but I think everybody understands that. It, it, and, and the industry is moving to short-term competition and, and the solar thing is affecting that and, and uh, demand response and, and the FERC order for that. Uh, so it's moving towards short-termism and hyper, what I call hyper competition, which from a societal point of view or governmental point of view, a government societal risk point of view, uh, that society is not paying for something that it may not need three years from now, those kinds of philosophies, but keep in mind don't forget the financing implications of those choices uh, because that strategy is going to push financing higher cost money, more equity, less debt, shorter term debt, higher interest rates. And, and if, if uh, the cost of capital is, let's say, 30 to 40 percent of the cost of electricity or gas, uh, cost of capital embedded in the supply system, and you double your cost of capital, you, you substantially uh, ruin the economics that you thought you had in mind when you were doing all the competition uh, because of your cost of capital substantially changed. So that's, I, I think it's underappreciated and not in everybody's analysis, and it should be in everybody's analysis. Um, if I could just say a, a couple of points um, that I think will accelerate development of appropriate uh, transmission. I wanted first to amplify what Abigail mentioned about stakeholder partnership. Uh, I think that is very, very important. We're in the process of licensing an 85 mile transmission uh, upgrade and replacement from Northern New York all the way to the beautiful Adirondacks. We call it our Moses Adirondack transmission line. And we made sure that we employed the latest technology and creativity so that we will stay within, in fact, we're even reducing the existing right-of-way to minimize, uh, you know, 
view shed impacts uh, along that path. And we're partnering with uh, the communities along the way. And the other thing that she said is environmental justice and equity. I think that is a very, very important uh, principle that uh, should be highlighted as we partner with our stakeholder um, along when we build projects, whether they're generation or transmission. The other thing to really catalyze appropriate development, I, and I mentioned this in my talk, is the FERC 1000 and ISO planning process. We need to do, I think, do it faster and better. I think that the horizon, planning horizon, horizon should be extended to 20 years, not just 10 years, and that it should capture and take into account consumer benefits and the network effect of having a more efficient grid and being able to bring clean energy uh, from remote areas to load centers. Right now, that's, you know, I know it's just starting, but, but we need to make that more effective and efficient and faster. So I, uh, I see Jim Hecker taking notes down there. Jim, uh, could you respond to Gil and just say, uh, are significant improvements in Order 1000 possible? Uh, and uh, if so, uh, how? I think everybody today has been talking about the, uh, uh, the expansion of the grid in various jurisdictions, uh, in various organized markets, and internationally, and that's all very positive, and, a lot, and Order 1000 I agree with that, it makes a lot of that possible. Um, the results are very spotty. And when we look at interregional transmission, when we look at planning a transmission for public policy purposes, such as the Clean Power Plan or state RPSs, uh, again, uh, performance is very uneven. Um, uh, and uh, I think that, uh, I think that uh, FERC uh, would do well uh, to revisit uh, the rule, not reinventing the wheel, but finding ways that they might be able to uh, accelerate the process as, as Gil has mentioned. And I think that's easily done with some additional federal requirements or at least some, some guidelines. Jim, any thoughts on that? I uh, do, and I was actually gonna ask Jim if you had a, an opinion on the, the, the problem with interregional transmission projects, and this is my specialty, so I've encountered this problem again and again, is you double your pleasure, right? You have two ISOs with internal mechanisms and procedures that you have to try to figure out, both present and future. And so one of the interregional implications, for example, of how PJM is managing its RTEP system is to impose enormous interconnection, uh, RTEP costs on the projects that try to take capacity out of PJM and migrate it to other regions. Uh, if you could understand w the logic of the process, I think uh, that would be better, but it's a black box. And uh, the commission is, is looking at this as we speak, but that kind of risk makes the transfer of capacity across into regional uh, borders, uh, a much more risky proposition than we thought it would be 10 years ago. And, and I hope, I, I did actually talk to the chairman about this a couple of weeks ago, would really like to see FERC address this as part of an interregional uh, effort to encourage interregional projects when this specific piece of black box cost allocation actually discourages it. Uh, Abby, yes. He's nodding. So I said Jim agrees with me, yeah. more or less. <laughs> was he nodding or ducking? I, I think he was <laughs> nodding. I'd like the record to show he was nodding. <laughs> I don't know that this is right, but my speculation is that, and, and perhaps if John Wellinghoff is here, he can tell us this, if this is right or wrong. He just left. Did he just leave? <laughs> well, then I'll just, I'll just speculate wildly um, without any accountability. Um, <laughs> I think that wading into the territory of getting um, 
the PJMs and MISOs of the world to talk to each other, um, suggest rules about cost allocation and, and interregional transmission planning was so controversial, and, and at the time it seemed like it was pushing the envelope of FERC's authority. Um, and not that those questions have been put to rest, but I think now that, that Order 1000 has been upheld, I think there's a much more aggressive role that FERC could be playing in um, reviewing the adequacy of the tariffs that are being filed and, and making, asking more. Um, and and it, it's very discretionary now what any state does. And I think that the, the FERC, it's time to be more prescriptive about what the FERC needs to do to ensure just and reasonable rates in the planning process. <laughs> uh, I see Bill uh, Hederman has, his, has had his hand up, and uh, it is a good time to hear from the Energy Department. Uh, okay, uh, uh, you can hear from Bill I don't Hederman. know, this, is this a question or a, uh, a it response? Was, it was a, a reaction to this discussion. Um, but this is Bill Hederman and not the Department of Energy, so. <laughs> um, back around 1990, this is dealing with the short-term issue uh, and gas contracts. So in the early 90s, I was actually hired to help a uh, firm come up with a 20-year contract to offer to an independent power project in New York State to bump out coal and put in natural gas. And it involved a 20-year contract for the gas, and it involved um, coming up with the sweet spot that would beat out coal, but e extract most of the remaining value for the seller of the contract. And they sold a trillion cubic feet of gas in this deal. And it, you, you, Pete, probably recall there were a lot of long-term gas contracts with um, gas utilities in the old days, the take or pay contracts and wiping out a few pipelines kind of killed off that business model. But this contract won. Interestingly, uh, the, the, the company I'm talking about was Enron. And so I'm not sure how the contract <laughs> did over the whole 20 years. <laughs> but uh, but I, they, the idea of getting long-term contracts when the price of gas was so low that looking at a 20-year deal where some intermediary did the aggregation and the guarantees was possible with where the prices are today. It may be possible again, but nobody's kind of tried to take that imaginative leap recently. I just wanted to bring that into the discussion. Uh, other questions? Um, so my, my question, and I think it kind of plays well onto what we, you guys were just talking about. I, I wanted to know, like, I mean, in, in overall, I mean, you, you want a more efficient grid. I, I mean, I, I'm not sure I'm not transmission, but, but I, thought, I thought loss is something like 5% and somewhere in that, that range. Somebody else, I'm sure, will correct me. Um, but uh, to what extent is it designed as almost like a, you know, like major valve versus like arterial lens for the projects for like the entire state in terms of, you know, trying to hit like certain like major goals in in like reducing the amount of transmission loss, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, especially scenes how you guys seem like you have a really tight handle on like where the junction points are, which I learned from, from the slides here, you know, the, the two Canadian junction points, I'd imagine Connecticut is one, and you know you have to get down to, you know, New York, and I'd imagine it would require some serious commitment for the, um, for like the wind projects because I mean, obviously, you're going to want to have uh, a fairly high-voltage high uh, line going from there. Thank you. Anybody want to jump in on that? I think the skills. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I mentioned about the improvements in technology that's happening uh, across the board. Uh, Ed talked about, you know, HVDC high-voltage direct current. We actually uh, partnered with, with Ed and his team and built a line from northern New Jersey under underground underneath the Hudson River to uh, West 49th Street. 
Con Ed substation. That's a 60, 660 megawatt HVDC line. Prior to that, uh, Ed and his, his partners also built a line from Sayreville, New Jersey, all the way to Long Island. HVDC, same thing, about 660 megawatts. So from a technology perspective, I think losses and congestion, that's, that's getting better and better. Data analytics, sensors, um, material science, that, that's going to improve. The challenge really, and we've seen this in Texas, to bring clean energy from remote areas to the load center requires transmission. And, and we need to do that within the state and we need to do it uh, interregionally to achieve, say, our climate goals in the United States, we say about you know 80% by 2050, right? That's, that's kind of the, the long-term goal. In New York, it's 50 by 30. To reach those type of numbers, you need everything. You need everything behind the meter, meaning at homes and businesses, commercial, industrial buildings, uh, and you, we need to do renewables at, at a grid scale level. And optimizing that and doing it with uh, least impact to, to communities um, is a challenge, but I think it's doable with the technology that we have today and the technologies that are going to emerge uh, going forward. Uh, we have a question here. Yes, hi, Cesar Penafiel. Um, with regards to the need to uh, have long-term price incentive uh, to uh, encourage investment, particularly in, in high upfront uh, technologies, uh, do you see a uh, change in the capacity markets in New York, perhaps the way PJM and New England have gone towards a long-term forward market? And also, what are the uh, problems with uh, you know, uh, having a, uh, per power purchase agreements and uh, a contract for differences. Are, are those at the ISO level? Where, where would be the policy changes necessary to accomplish that? I, I could, I, I could uh, share an anecdote to, from history uh, just to have a little fun here. And that is, in Germany, the feed-in tariff was written, and I happened to be in the room a lot when it was written. It was one of the gang that sort of developed it. And originally it was a five-year commitment. You got your revenues for five years. And the late famous Hermann Scheer, member of the German Bundestag and solar leader of Europe, asked me at a break in a meeting, uh, how do I get your Wall Street to finance my solar revolution? And I said, my answer was a quip. I said, take your five years, make it 20, and stand back and watch the capital flow in here. Because the whole objective was to attract long-term debt capital, low-cost capital, to renewable energy in Germany. That was the purpose of the discussion. And by pointing out that the short-term commitment only allowed short-term lending. Well, long and short, uh, we went to see the president of KFW later that day and told him the story, and he told Herman Scheer, yeah, it's correct. So they, they shook hands. It was never written down. You, never, you can't read this because it was never written down. They agreed and shook hands that if Herman Scheer could get a change in the Bundestag from a five-year law to a 20-year, that he, the president of KFW, would, on his authority only, in, offer the solar loan program for Germany, right? And Herman Scheer laughed in a phone call a week later and said he can't believe what happened. He went to the Bundestag and he attached an amendment to a bill that was going through. And all he said that he said in the sentence or the phrase was, in previous law such and such, line so and so, changed the number five to the number 20. That's it, okay? <laughs> so that's where the 20 year thing and the feed-in tariff worldwide came from. And its objective was not to subsidize anything the way it's viewed now. The purpose was, to, what do we have to do to attract long-term, low-cost debt capital to renewable energy? Same question we're dealing with here, and the long-term commitments to Ed's point uh, is the key to the whole thing. It's, it's a great question. Yeah. Uh, that's the challenge of today. You know, prices in upstate New York has been the lowest since the creation of the New York ISO, right? Because gas prices are really low, uh, consumption is relatively flat, um, you know, so they set the record in November at lowest prices in upstate New York, and then that record was beat in December, <laughs> and maybe, I don't know whether January will beat December, uh, but at, at very low prices of wholesale market, uh, power, power prices in the wholesale market, that means when we not only encourage renewable, it's two things. You need long-term contracts so that they, they can get financed, but now the premium is gonna be higher. 
relative to conventional power, right? So the question is, how do we get large-scale renewable built? People talk about, well, we need a PPA. But we need to take into account uh, from the utilities perspective, for example, who require utilities to hold all those PPAs, it impacts their balance sheet because it's treated as debt. You know, so how do you account for that? Uh, how do you solve that problem? There are folks, uh, my, in fact, my head of strategy is here and CFO, Bob Lurie, is telling me, well, probably the cheapest for society is to securitize that premium. You know, socialize it and securitize it over a long period of time. That's what's best for society. If we really want to meet the renewable targets that we have. But it's a great question, and those are the kind of things that will be talked about, wrestled through this clean energy standard pr proceeding that will, that have started in January here in New York, and supposedly they have to issue an order in July. I, I, yeah. That's absolutely right, and if I could add one, one note, if you look at what's happened in Germany and to some extent in Texas, what we may wind up with is an energy market where the price of power is constantly under downward pressure because of the renewables, because they're fuels from heaven, right? There's no fuel, fuel cost. So the capacity market has to prop up the gas-fired power plants that need to be there in order to keep the lights on and the transmission lines. Now that's that's the system of the future, I think. Energy prices will be low, like in Germany, yeah. and um, the capacity markets have to work. That's I, again, from yeah, I, uh, I'll just, from yeah, I'll just, I think we've got to take it a little bit, a little bit more from the top. I mean, think, think of uh, the clean power plan, and uh, just a few months after it was recognized that this would go ahead, uh, companies uh, started teaming up, you know, electric companies, gas companies, uh, and uh, uh, if we think of what is going on in certain jurisdictions, New England, when the policy is be evolves, and this, today's discussion is great, and, the, and it's very exciting what we're seeing in New York in the last few months, and the clean energy standard being defined, everybody focuses. The, um, the, we, the, the heads are put together, the technology and the latest technology that has been developed and can be used suddenly finds a platform to be used. The policy change, the initiatives from Governor Cuomo and the people that we've heard from today is the instigators, the first step. Once you have that, there are different mechanisms and there are many different mechanisms that can bring good solutions. We talk a lot about existing technology and potential technology. The best way to get those things together and have new good solutions is to have a direction and some visibility in terms of policy, policy goals. And the discussion today and the reason why it's very exciting and extremely positive is that. Last point, you know of many investment funds, holders of capital around the world that are very attentive to infrastructure investment. And when they think of infrastructure investment, they think of clean, clean tech, renewable, the way to the future. How will we light New York in 50 years? That's where they are at. Those funds are available in the capital markets. What they want is a good visibility on policy. They want to, they want to team up with experts, Eds of this world, Hydro-Quebecs of this world. The capital is there. The funding is there. It is not the old model. It is a new model. And when the policy uh, uh, leaders present visibility, great results come out. And I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. So as we wind this uh, up, uh, I'll give a, a, a pitch to our news site uh, at uh, Yeni News. And if you go there, you'll see a, uh, a portal called the Clean Power Plan Hub. Uh, and the, um, it is a state-by-state -state, uh, collection of key documents and facts and requirements uh, about the clean, the clean power plan. The discouraging thing to pick up on this last point we just made is you immediately see a red state, blue state division uh, on the clean power plan. And uh, that, that wasn't always the case uh, in energy <coughs> policy. It was more regional, it was more resource based. Now we've, we've seen, a, uh, particularly when climate comes into it, a, uh, a division along uh, partisan lines about uh, even whether there's a problem. <coughs> So that may suggest that um, 
what's going to happen in the near term is that the states that that uh, can set policy are going to be the leaders, uh, and uh, and perhaps that's the the best we can hope for as these uh, as these laboratories of experimentation um, tackle their their own problems. Uh, so uh, we've hit our closing time. I want to thank the panel very much for the, the great discussion, and and uh, off we go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.